I'm uh, Rob Duggar. I'm an INET advisory board member and a governing board member. And I'm honored to be a co-chair of INET's Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Global Working Group. This working group uh, now consists of about 280 people worldwide who are doing work on all aspects of human capital development, inequality, uh, early education, education reform, even the philosophy of what constitutes the issues of uh, inequality. What we found, very important in this session, we'll be connecting dots from several presentations that have already taken place here at INET. Two nights ago, uh, Antonio Damasio revealed to us in a very powerful way how the human brain has portions of it which are old evolutionarily and which give high priority to the ability of each of us to manage our relationships in a sense of well-being for ourselves, our family, and our communities. What his talk the other night indicated clearly is when there's impairment of these regions of the brain, even though someone may appear to be rational, able to make calculations, recount facts, discuss things quite clearly, they're not able to make um, continuous, effective decisions about their own welfare. They, in fact, make disastrous decisions about their own welfare, the welfare of their families, people around them, and their communities. This suggests something extremely important. It suggests that if a policy offered by a group of economists from INET or any place else, if a policy put forward to solve a problem does not contain in it components that speak to these parts of the brain that address feelings of well-being, security of, of uh, family and community, that policy will not be felt to be complete and therefore it won't be accepted. The rationality of these emotional or well-being parts of the brain need to be understood very clearly. If you're under attack and you become frightened, you react heuristically out of great feeling, rationally, that you run away or fight. This aspect of human thinking motivates a lot of what we do here in the Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Working Group. We're looking for those aspects of economic policy that in effect provide people with the capabilities to effectively operate in a modern society, a modern economy. In essence, we are dealing with pre-distribution rather than redistribution. We are asking the question, what is it that we pre-distribute to people to provide them the capabilities to operate effectively in a modern society? And I'm really honored today because we have Jim Heckman, Armin Falk, and Ronald Shetkat uh, here, leaders in our uh, human capital and economic opportunity working group um, uh, process talking about different aspects, employment, uh, the capacities here to talk about employment, neuroscience, and all the rest. We'll talk about all of that. Um, but I've just been handed a note. Ah, okay. The, uh, should I read this note? Okay. The center, the Axica Center, has permitted us to bring the young scholars into this session. So we're about to be... Um, fairly crowded, which is very exciting to me because I personally find those folks, I've been watching much of, the, uh, much of these sessions with them and the discussions there are lively to say the least. Uh, we have over 200 and so they will be uh, wandering here fairly soon. This is great. Uh, we're going to start with a slight change. In, oh, here they're coming. Excellent. Uh, we're going to start with a slight change in the sequence uh, we have uh, Steve Durloff, one of our co-chairs. Jim Heckman, Nobel Prize winner, is our 
working group, global working group, Commandante. Uh, Steve Durloff is a co-chair with him, and I'm a co-chair, but trust me, I'm more of an administrator than, 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 uh, than anything else. Steve, unfortunately, is not well and won't be joining us. So today, we're going to begin with Armin, and then hear from uh, Ronald Shetkat, uh, and then Jim Heckman is going to give his own presentation, and he's going to give Steve Durloff's presentation. So we're going to have a sort of compression there. Uh, we're going to be operating under fairly strict time rules. I know that sounds uh, almost antisocial in this uh, particular uh, conference culture, but uh, I have cards, and as you see, the cards have a number on both sides, so the audience will see what the presenter sees, and I'm hoping that that has a kind of uh, incentive effect on the presenter, because the presenter knows that uh, the audience knows that the presenter knows that the audience knows. So um, we're going to let these uh, young people keep coming in, but I think we're going to, in the interest of time, simply begin. So Armin, uh, you're going to be first, uh, then Ronald, and then, uh, then Jim. I should say uh, all of their bios except Armin's are in the, um, in the catalog, so I'm not going to go through a long biological, uh, bi biographical uh, summary. Armin uh, is on his uh, website, so I encourage you to take a look at that. He's done uh, terrific work in a lot of areas, and uh, I encourage you to look at that uh, quite remarkable uh, biography and curriculum vitae. Armin. Okay. Do we have a pointer? Uh, that's the, okay. All right. Can I use that microphone too? Okay. Yes, it's, Good. it's on. All right. Okay, thank you very much, in particular Jim, for inviting me, and um, all of you for being here. I have only 15 minutes, so I just begin. Fasten seatbelts, I want to talk about four papers at least. Um, and the main idea is uh, on this very first slide already, there's a close relationship between fairness, motivation, and how we should organize the workplace, how we should organize the employment relationship. Um, all that research centers around the problem of motivation. It's one of the most important problems management has to solve. The goal is to have motivated employees to take initiative, identify and solve problems, in one word, uh, workers, employees who are cooperative. This is actually vital for the success of firms and organizations, but also for society as a whole. The question is, how do we solve that motivation problem? I could spend hours for why it exists, but again, I don't have much time. So how to solve it? There are two views. Uh, one view I want to call the traditional economic view. It centers around the assumption that people are motivated in particular by uh, money. They are self-interested. And there's little role for fairness, trust, and social comparison to affect behavior or motivation. Uh, as a consequence, the instruments suggested by this economic approach are extrinsic incentives, control, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Is everybody in now? Uh, it's great. It's great. Um, and here's the alternative view, and I think this is why it's fitting quite nicely into this conference. Um, the alternative or new view, if you like, is humans are social animals. Now, you may question the novelty of that statement going back to Aristotle. He actually called humans social animals. But um, in terms of economics, it is a fairly new perspective. And the perspective can be described in terms of people compare themselves with others. We call that social comparison. Fairness and trust are strong human motivators. and the, uh, <clears throat> the effects are reinforced by self-selection of employees into organizations. Now, who is right? The traditional view or this new idea, this new perspective? Um, and many people have thought about this, and here's one famous quote by George Stiegler, a Nobel laureate. He said in 1981, when self-interest and ethical values are in conflict, much of the time, most of the time, in fact, self-interest theory will win. Okay, that's a, that's a bold statement. But that line of thinking has a long history in economics. Uh, David Hume, for example, wrote, political writers have established it as a maxim that in contriving any system of government, every man ought to be supposed to be a knave and to have no other end in all his actions than his private interests. Or likewise, Edgeworth, one of the uh, founding fathers of modern economics, wrote, the first principle of economics is that every agent, every agent, is actuated only, only by self-interest. Now, does this answer the question who is right? The answer is no. It does not answer the question. What constitutes human motivation is ultimately an empirical question. And we rely here on surveys, experiments, and observational data. And in particular, I would like to show you four studies. The first is related to social comparisons, related to uh, your work, 
as you will see in a second. The question we ask here is how important is the relative wage in comparison to the absolute wage you get? Based on that evidence, I'm going to ask how is reciprocity affecting work effort? Does it pay to treat employees fair, fairly? And what about unfair behavior? What are the detrimental possible effects of unfair behavior? If I have time, I will talk about hidden cost of control. Can we, too, can we control too much? And does that reduce motivation, perhaps, because it's signaling distrust? And finally, how is all, all of this uh, reinforced by self-selection, given that the composition of the workforce is endogenous and, and will depend on the uh, institutional framework? OK, so here's my first uh, empirical piece of evidence. The question is, do workers compare with each other, or generally people? If so, it would have far-reaching consequences for wage structure uh, in firms. Um, why? Because if people compare, it's not only the absolute wage that matters, but also the, the, the relation to other people's wage in the, in, in the organization. So that has important implications for organization structure, information policies, etc. Now, how do we? F ah, here's here's in essence the paper in, in one slide. It's a nice cartoon. It's illustrating exactly the point I want to make, uh, slightly more scientifically. Here, this is the boss. This is the worker, and he says, "Okay." If you can't see your way to giving me a pay raise, how about giving Parkinson, that's this guy here, a pay cut? Okay? So if you can't increase my wage, at least pay him less. Okay? And that makes sense, of course, only if people are uh, comparing themselves to others. Now, here's our evidence. Uh, we use functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, uh, to study how the reward system, forgive me, this is a very uh, rough uh, statement here, the reward system, the venture stratum in particular, encodes information about absolute versus relative income. Uh, in other words, is fairness and social comparison uh, encoded in the brain. This is actually one of my co-authors, and this is uh, a scanner. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty good looking, but you don't see that now. Here you get the information. Here you uh, 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 enter your information. It's kind of a, a mouse uh, type of uh, interface. Okay? The design is very, very simple, but I yet skip some of the details. In essence, people solve a task, and it's two people at the same time. This is actually called hyperscanning, but it's true, it's called hyperscanning. So it's two people at the, same ta at the same time being scanned in two scanners simultaneously. They solve exactly the same work, work task, okay? And then they receive payoff information. And I would like to sh show, uh, have you concentrating here on this table here, because that is, in a sense, um, showing the idea of the experiment. We keep constant your own income, in this case 60 euro, and vary the income of the other person. It's either 30, 60, or 120. That means you either earn twice as much as the other person, the same as the other person, or half as much as the other person, keeping your own absolute income constant, okay? And then we look at how this information is processed in the brain. Here the two hypotheses, self-interest would predict it's only the absolute income people care about, social comparison, uh, on the other hand, would predict that there's a strong activation of the ventral striatum in response to higher relative wages. Okay? Um, I don't want to tell you what's on this slide uh, in detail, so let me just do that verbally. That's the area we are focusing on here, the ventral striatum. We show a strong effect of relative wages, okay? and it's particularly bad for people if they receive less than the other person. As, a, as an aside, and, and I think this is interesting for you, Jim, and this is why I put it on the slide, People with a lower social status, and we can experimentally induce that, seem to perceive disadvantages, inequalities, less severe, less negatively. I think this is extremely interesting because it, it shows why inequality can be so persistent in society, because they just don't suffer as much uh, people uh, from a low uh, social uh, status, okay? Does it mean 10 more minutes? That means 10 more minutes. Oh, good, good. Oh, can I, I, think I can slow down. It's actually about eight. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 I shouldn't have asked, okay. So based on, on, the, on the idea that people compare with each other, there's social preference, if you like, we asked the next question, how is reciprocity affecting work effort? Um, can it pay off to treat workers in a fair way? And here's a, here's a, a very simple experiment which has been done in, in, in many variants. <clears throat> it's called the gift exchange game. We have two players. One is the employer, he can pay a wage. There's an employee, she can either accept or reject the offer. In case she accepts, she has to choose a costly effort level. And payoffs are as such that um, uh, firms have an, or employers have an interest in, in, in paying low wages and receiving a high effort. And it's exactly reversed for agents. They would like to have a high wage and, and provide little effort. Okay? So it's exactly mimicking um, the uh, motivation problem. Okay? And there's a conflict of interest here. 
So what are the hypotheses? This is for real money, of course. Uh, the self-interest hypothesis would be, OK, um, regardless of the wage, you should always put in the lowest possible effort level. Why? Because effort is increasingly costly, and there's no point in doing this. We abstract it from reputational concerns, for career concerns, et cetera, et cetera. It's a one-shot situation, so people should just put in the lowest possible effort. And principals are not stupid. Anticipating this, they should always pay the lowest wage. Now, fairness and reciprocity matters. Um, then fair behavior, higher wages, should be rewarded, higher effort. Unfair behavior should be punished. And the higher the wage, the higher should be the effort. So this is a straightforward testable implication of two notions of how the labor market works, either being uh, populated only by selfish people or by people who are also reciprocal. And here's the data. This is uh, just one example out of dozens of experiments that, that show a similar point. Here, here I show wages. These are different wage levels. And you can see here that on average, the uh, effort level is increasing in the wage payment, uh, showing the existence of uh, positive uh, reciprocity. OK. There's also a dark side of reciprocity. Um, one famous example is, is uh, the experience Firestone was going through. Kruger and Maas have a nice paper on this. Here's the story. In 2000, Firestone had to take back 14.4 million car tires. Why? Because of <coughs> severe quality problems. The tires were exploding on hot days. And the US Office for Street Safety had Firestone responsible for many fatal car accidents. And the sad outcome is that um, 271 people were killed. The reason, and I'm not going into details here, the reason for why Firestone was experien experiencing these uh, quality problems was that uh, it had treated the employees in a very, very unfair way. They negatively reciprocated by providing low quality. Okay? And in fact, there's uh, brain evidence again um, showing that punishing someone who has been unfair to you is experienced as sweet or, or pleasurable. Um, and this is pretty much what was going on. On top, treating people in an unfair way can cause stress and poor health. And this is what we're showing uh, in this paper here. Uh, it's a very simple experiment where, again, there's, there's two players in a sense, an employee, he has to work. It's a very tedious task, no fun, no intrinsic motivation whatsoever. And that creates some revenue, OK? The employer, just like in real life, does not work at all, but, but uh, decides on how to share total revenues, OK, between him, the employer, and the employee, OK? And we measure heart rate variability of employees throughout the experiment as an indicator of stress, OK? The larger the deviation, that's the hypothesis between what is considered fair or appropriate, the larger should be the stress reaction. And stress, as you know, is one of the most important reasons for cardiovascular disease. And therefore, treating people unfair, causing stress, causing all these adverse health, pro uh, these, these health problems, is super inefficient. Why? Because healthy employees work better. That's the organization perspective. But also, there's a tremendous cost for society in case that unfairness uh, actually causes stress and, and cardiovascular disease. Um, and the, 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 uh, the figure I, was, I wanted to show you didn't show up before because this is made on an apple and it didn't show. But trust me, we find a very strong, almost linear relationship between the perception of being treated unfairly in this simple experiment and heart rate variability. People who are treated in an unfair way experience strong and systematic stress. Okay? Uh, we also show the exact same thing in a large representative data set. Um, it's based on, on the uh, uh, social economic panel. <clears throat> and here we show that people who answer the question, do you consider your wages fair or unfair, have a very different health status. People who say that their wage is unfair report a much worse health status uh, compared to those who consider their wage as fair. Controlling for the absolute wage payment, of course, and many other things like personality, occupation status, etc. So I don't want to show you these tables in detail. So reciprocity is important, both positive and negative. And how much time do I have? Two minutes, good. OK, then let me try to get across another issue here, which is con the, uh, the interaction between controlling someone and uh, trust and motivation. All incentive-based systems involve control, right? You have to check whether people are producing output, whether they are present at the workplace, etc. And the question is, how do we perceive being controlled? Does it signal distrust? Does it reduce motivation? And here's a very simple experiment that I want to show you. Let me quickly go over this. I want to just show you the game tree. This is, a, this is an intelligent audience. I can just show you the game tree. 
Okay, here's a principle, okay? He can either restrict the agent's choice set or not restrict it. Restricting it means controlling, okay, not trusting. Not restricting means trusting the agent. What does it mean? If the principle trusts the, princip uh, the, principal trusts the agent, the agent's choice set, and X is what the agent can choose, goes from 0 to 120. So he's basically, he can do whatever he wants to, okay, from 0 to 120. The higher X, the higher is the payoff for the principal, but the higher X, the lower is the uh, payoff for the agent, okay? So the agent has an incentive to always provide the lowest possible X, okay? Now, if the principal restricts, the choice set is smaller, right? Then the lowest possible X is 10, okay? Now, from a self-interest perspective, it's straightforward what the principal should do. He should, of course, always restrict because the agent is expected always to provide the minimum. In this case, 10. In this case, 0. But notice, restricting your choice set, controlling someone, does signal some distrust. Why? Well, if I was trusting you, I wouldn't have to restrict your choice set in the first place. And there could be detrimental negative effects of that very action of distrusting an agent. Um, and this is exactly what we find. Look at the median values. X, in case the principal controls, does not trust is 10. If he trusts, it's 20, it's twice as high. And the standard prediction, the self-interest prediction, is exactly the opposite, OK? You should see higher x values if someone is controlled versus being trusted, OK? One minute, thank you. I know it's not true. You're so, so polite. That's it. Uh, <laughs> um, trust. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, trust is important. But you shouldn't trust too much either, OK? I, I don't have time to give a balanced view here, so let me be a bit, OK. Uh, Self-selection, that's an absolutely straightforward but very important point. Incentive schemes do not only affect work effort of a given workforce. What is often overlooked is the system that you create, the, the, the organization structure, the incentives people face will also affect the composition of the workers. It's endogenous. And for example, we find that in, in various papers, if you in, introduce variable pay, it attracts more able, fewer female employees, more risk-tolerant employees, and more selfish employees. And there's also a margin along personality in Big Five, OK? And I'm skip, I skipped the data here. So let me really conclude. This is my summary. Motivation should not exclusively rely on extrinsic incentives and money. And I hope I was able to convince you that social preferences are important and key motivators. Trust, fairness, reciprocity, and this is not an exclusive list, are important human motivators that need to be taken into account in designing organizations and society. In one word, treating employees with respect is not only morally desirable, but also economically rational. Thank you very much. Ronald, the uh, floor is yours. While you're getting to the podium, let me stress that an aspect of what we are looking at in this Human Capital and Economic Opportunity Working Group is the effect of perceived inequality and how that, in the concern about inequality, there is a, a sense of distrust, a, a concern about fairness. So at the macro level, not only do you have to treat, so to speak, uh, at the micro level, not only do you have to treat employees correctly, but at the macro level, in a sense, you have to treat voters fairly. And in a way of connecting dots between Antonio Damaso the other night, and Amartya Sen today, this issue of justice and fairness is critically important. 